Columbia. Columbia, South Carolina. Uh, I have so many questions, but I'm going to keep it to hopefully one basic question. So, it's basically a concern. A uh, concern that as we drove through Accra, watching development, as you say, you know, Accra, Ghana, as well is, as a whole, is growing leaps and bounds. And you know and I know that other countries are coming in and planting their seed. And we're constructing high-rise buildings and bringing money in and developments and taking land and and it looks very familiar. It looks like a trend that a place I come from called America. And I wonder whether or not this is being discussed. Because on one aspect I hear that the chiefs own the land. Or some of the land. I'm not sure. And I understand that uh, my brother had broken down various types of land, family land, or, or giving land as gifts, or you know, chief lands and you know and all that there. But I'm just kind of curious. Because it sounds like the chiefs own the land, they have the power to make decisions on who they can sell to and make stipulations, like agriculture, no GMOs be sold on this land. Or outside uh, people who's coming in purchasing land to not give them 50 years lease, but yet a five year lease. Because we do know that like the eminent domain happens as the government can take land, they also will try to find to take your land. And so that's my concern and my, that's my question is, you know, how much of the power does these chiefs have as when it comes to ownership of land to make those decisions of who's person and what do they do with it? Okay. Right. Uh, in 1992, they wrote a new constitution for Ghana, and there is a definition inside that constitution that land is the property of those yet unborn. Uh, the reality in Ghana is the land as custodians not owners. The chief doesn't own the land, he's a custodian of it. That's why he can only give out a 50 year lease because he's gonna be gone afterwards and what he does will be able to be undone by those who come after. Uh, the families can't actually sell the land because it's not theirs. It is the children who ain't get born this land. So uh, that worry under the 1992 constitution, I don't think is a problem, unless, um, and I'm gonna say something to you. When I came uh, in 2003, uh, through contacts that I had, I discovered that the American government was trying to get that part of the constitution changed. All right, next question. Okay, I'll go over here. Okay, just make it brief, huh? Thank you very much. My name is Quincy. I'm 25 years in Nigeria, 40 years in America, and 10 years in Ghana. So let's deal with reality. I'm sure people can share an example. But how about somebody who has crossed the bridge? I just want to share. Land, valuable, very good. How do you acquire it and make it safe? I have three titles of like in front of the ocean and all that. We're talking about legalities, but let's deal with how you go through it and get it. First, you do due diligence. Number two, you don't put your money there. The signatures have to be the same as what they have as a land commission. Once you have that, you have something to build up. Then you can be prepared for the registration. After registration, title, because nobody mentioned 
title here. But because of uh, bribery and all that, there are some people who are experiencing how to deal with the system. You're talking to one here. Number two, business ownership of business. We're talking about licenses and all that. Either you have a Ghanaian partner, well, that could be the first step because it saves you from putting down $300,000 or 500000 So you can break it from there and work towards citizenship and later on you can overcome. And all. So I'll have an idea for the brother here who needs help. I have a B&B, &B, bed and breakfast, that will be open by January in readiness for our year, 2019. Okay. I have an expansion plan, and I need uh, what I would call a uh, co-investor who is interested in that. It's situated in a very good area at the back of West Hills Mall, where they're building 1,200 apartments. Each one, three bedroom, is selling for $300,000, 1.5. So it's like a millionaire troll right there. Convenient to the beaches, Kokobite and all that, you go going for tour, you can go straight to Cape Coast and on walking distance. The mall is there, if you don't like the food. I mean the conveniences of being able to go. And then we develop it directly. We're serviced by people like us. So the new ones coming, they have somewhere to go to first clear a lot of our problems. And they are coming to Ghana this is what I'm engaging in. Real estate, real estate. Okay, thank, thank you very much. All right, any more questions? Okay, one last one here. Okay. How you doing, brother? I'm good, I'm good. Welcome. Uh, greetings, everyone. Uh, I call myself Enobi, Brother Enobi, and I am uh, flying in from Cleveland, Ohio, where it's very cold. Um, I have a question for the panel. Um, I'm not sure what this new resolution is called, this new movement. I'll just call it the Year of the Return 2019. I think they kind of phrase it like that. Uh, to my understanding, and, and I could be wrong, it, it seems like uh, the U.S. government has their hand in this particular movement, uh, the Year of Return, uh, that kind of thing. Um, and you know, coming from the states, anything that the U.S. government has their hand in is something you need to look at three, four, five, six times. Um, that's not something that us Americans take, or Black Americans take lightly, uh, based on history. So I'm just wondering, you know, us who are thinking about repatriating, uh, coming back, is you know, with our history with the U.S. government, is that something that we should be concerned about? It seems like they're backing this this movement. It seems like they're in cahoots with the uh, Ghanaian government, and that makes me feel a little uneasy because I don't want to have any parts of that government, anything that they adore, anything that they back. So I'm just wondering if you know we should be concerned because you know they're all happy and they're excited about this new movement, and it seems like they have their hand in it. And again, I'm concerned because I don't want to have anything that I'm going to move forward. Thank you. Okay. Who wants to answer that last one? Anyone from the panel? Okay. Go ahead. Regarding your return, I think um, <clears throat> all governments are having their hand in it. And I think the U.S. government probably has their hand in everything going on in the world. So it's pretty difficult to get away from that. And what I will offer you is that. <clears throat> I just left. You know, I just left the U.S. last year, and what I see happening is that the U.S. really wants to get Africans out of there anyway, and so they are taking advantage of this opportunity. And I think, perfectly for me, is I see it as a win-win. I'm trying to get my children and my grandchildren out of there too. So if the U.S. government, as a matter of fact, I think I'm going to personally call Donald Trump and ask him to get some money. It's good. It's good. We never got reparations. And they can start right here. Maybe if they just send us home. Bring us home. Yes. Because we're not getting treated well there at all. 
And so I see it as a wonderful opportunity for Africans to make their escape. You know, because it's just getting worse in the US. And I've, I've, seen it, I've only been in Ghana for one year, but it seems to me Ghana is just getting better. And so, the Ghanaian government is, is initiated the concept of the year return primarily to increase the tourism and the revenue in Ghana. And since that initiation, the African American Association of Ghana and a couple other organizations called BADA have taken the initiative to, to lean on the government to provide incentive for historians to participate in that year of return. And so there's going to be some benefit for that as well. And you guys are here now, you, can, you might as well take advantage of it as well. You can do some investment right now that will pay dividends next as early as next year. And so what I would offer is that pay attention to whatever's going on around you and do what smart people do, take advantage of the opportunities that's in front of you available right now. Because it is an opportunity right now. Your return is going to be good, it's going to be big. I would, I would offer that you come back for the year of return and have some fun with it. But more importantly, while you're here right now, set something in place that you might be able to financially benefit from the year of return, which is exactly what I intend to do, so. OK, I'll stop for you after that question. Go ahead, so your name and where you My name is Lahe, and I'm um, currently living in um, captivity in, in Atlanta, Georgia. <laughs> and uh, my question is really a business question. I, mean, I have business questions, but food is more fundamental. So I wanted to ask uh, the gentleman who talked on food sovereignty, what is the rationale for doing food labeling as opposed to a full-on ban on GMOs? Yeah, thank you very much. We uh, actually, that is what we ultimately want, is a, a, a total moratorium on the whole issue of GMO. We don't want any GMOs here. But the call for labeling is a strategic and tactical one in to say that if we put that there, that's an extra obstacle for the industry to find this market unattractive. And they're already trying to wriggle out of it, that they want it labeled. And it's, it's, uh, we're already in court for the substantive case to say that Ghana doesn't want GMO. And uh, Ghana already passed a bill in 2011 allowing for them to go ahead and do uh, bioengineering. So we need like a referendum so these are issues that were put on the table for the, the population to start being aware. If we make it a mandatory labeling law, every food and feed that comes to Ghana needs to be labeled. That's the beginning of helping Ghanaians to be able to associate that this one is good, this one is bad. Eventually, when people stop buying your food, it's a way of stopping them coming. But we're not, we're not saying that we're, 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 we're accepting GMOs in Ghana, that, not at all. But it's a, a, strate a strategic, um, uh, rich that we're throwing in the system to make sure that uh, the whole world slows down. And it's better than saying that we're still going to continue fighting them, and otherwise they will bring in and it will be a voluntary labeling regime like how they're um, you know, working on right now. So insisting on a mandatory labeling regime is uh, a way to slow down the, the influx and the coming in of GMOs. And like I said, in the US there's no labeling of GMOs, so there's no traceability. There's no um, connection, there's no responsibility from, 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 from manufacturers, and we don't want that same repeated thing here, but we, civil society, we are totally against GMO um, from day one when courts try to get it out, but our call for the mandatory labeling is to let them see that these are the things you're going to have to get over if you're going to over the Ghanaian people like that. So I understand where you're coming from, but it's better than having um, not saying that we want a mandatory labeling regime and then they do do a voluntary labeling regime while we're still hustling and trying to fight them in court. Yeah. Because you do have some countries that, that, have, that ban it all together. Yes, yeah, and this, yeah. Is what, this is what we're working on. But you see the, 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 the lobby, the GMO lobby and the powerful um, agribusiness lobby is so powerful here um, that they, they influence our policy makers, they influence media people, and it's, it's, it's a, a big job that we're doing on the ground of uh, doing the advocacy that we do. There's very, very little funding coming from um, um, uh, well, on our side of the, of, of, of the spectrum. All the money is on the other side, that's pushing, pushing GMO. 
but it's a tactical call for them to realize that it's not going to be easy to all the Ghanaian people and start labeling it so that people can start associating it. Ghanaians will start making jokes about it, they'll start saying this one is not good, avoid that, and then it'll work back towards the, consumer, the manufacturer and then it'll slow down the road while we work for a proper referendum to say no to GMO at all. It seems like the, a risk with that strategy is like if in the U.S., the GMO, um, things that are have GMOs, the cheaper, right. you know, and they have no label. So if I'm just a consumer and I'm not educated in all of the dangers, then I'm going to see one piece of, you know, one food item that is much cheaper, more affordable, but it has GMOs. Right. We actually have to hunt to find something that says no GMO. We're going to pay a premium for it, mm -hmm. but you know, when we're thinking about the masses. It seems like it's going to be a challenge because then, if you're not, if you don't know about the carcinogens and all of the health risks, you're going to want to go with the more affordable option. And if it has no label, you're not the languages. Yeah. Right. This, which, 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 which is again, um, as a civil society organization, we find ourselves in a difficult place. But it's about continuing the advocacy on the ground, continuing um, educating our brothers and sisters because all the money, like I said, is on the other side. The media people, the people pushing it. And it's about engaging people one on one. That's why I asked you that in all of your interactions while you're here in the next seven days, your your, your conversations with Ghanaians should help them rub off why it's important to keep GMO out of Ghana. You know, and that's the way we can slowly, slowly. If each and every one does that for, for 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 one day each month, we can influence a lot of people, and that's what we're doing today. But we're totally against GMO in Ghana, but our call for the mandatory labeling is to make sure that they slow down their role and they're already wriggling about it. There was a um, I posted this last week by one professor, Alassan, saying that our call for mandatory labeling is, is, is um, uh, unnecessary and because they're protecting the business side. They want to have Ghana as an open market just for anyone to come and dump. I will say no. Thank you very much. Thank you. Let's give all the speakers a great round of applause. We're going to be around the floor. We're going to be the floor. We're going to be close down and then we can interact. And then don't forget the vendors. They have the moringa and all the good stuff clothing. So we'd like to thank Dr. Sorry to close out with a, a, a moment of silence. Oh. Our greatest prayer is always in silence. So let's humble ourselves before the creator. Breathing deeply and then how and then in silence to thank the creator for all of us things you have done successfully.